happy sri ram navami to all of you and uh, today we join on the occasion of uh, world bipolar day and this is the fourth webinar of the month series and uh, i welcome our president uh, dr george reddy sir sir please uh, welcome sir for today's webinar thank you pavan sir george sir now i welcome our vice president president elect dr minas nasirawadi sir sir welcome sir thank you pavan sir now i welcome dr sai krishna sai krishna is not yet joined his post sir i welcome dr kishan sir past president ips south zone and uh, member awards committee sir please welcome sir now i welcome our past treasurer vishal akula direct council member of indian psychiatric society welcome dr vishal bhai thank you pawan bhai thank you now i invite uh, today's speaker uh, dr keshavrao sir keshavrao sir uh, is the past president of ips telangana state branch and uh, sir is a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist in uh, nhs uk and sir has worked in various hospitals in different regions in uk and is familiar with the diagnosis and management practices of adhd asd and other childhood disorders and uh, sir is also director chetna hospital and uh, sir thank you first of all for accepting at a short notice and uh, uh, to give this lecture sir welcome sir keshavrao sir please welcome sir thank you thank you pawan sir sir over to so, president sir sir now could i start yes sir at the, at the outset sir uh, i i welcome uh, all the uh, members who have joined in and i think uh, for the, uh, after many months i think we see the program starting on time i think the credit goes to dr keshav or sir uh, and his expertise on the topic uh, thank you sir keshav or sir at a short notice uh, um, we thought we should definitely make a program and uh, might be i think sir as you are just talking before sir our uh, exposure or uh, many many a times for us to diagnose uh this big a problem at uh, in the childhood or in the adolescent phase i think it's definitely a task might, might be many times we know that it is a problem but might be we are not sure whether uh, it's uh, bipolar and sometimes a uh, lot of differential diagnosis also make us get confused and uh, uh, on behalf of entire office bearer sir and ec uh, i thank you sir for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, without wasting much time sir uh, i think i will hand over the mic to you sir please sir uh, take over sir dr keshav sir thank you jaj thank you for giving me this opportunity um the so the topic for the day is bipolar disorder in children and adolescent i will be focusing on the practical aspects particularly my end of experiences based on my experiences in uk so it won't be much theory but it's more of what's happening there and how we manage so i will give the brief outline of today's talk is uh, what is the prevalence because we need we need to know how common it is um, the importance of the disorder how many people get affected and how, how many can come to us really and then i talk about what is the camps scenario how camps is set up and what kind of patients we see a brief introduction then i go to mania in children and the differential diagnosis of that and then i go to the, the depression in adolescents and the pharmacological treatment of of of, of depression so the next slide the first slide is prevalence right now how frequent is uh, bipolar disorder in children so there are various studies studies in europe some of them say that it varies from 1 to 5% and uh, one meta analysis gives the prevalence of uh, uh, bipolar 1 in adolescents is about 1 which is almost same as uh, adults and but coming to younger children it is 0.2 to 0.4 so the bipolar disorder is uh, much less common in uh, younger children and that's why we don't find many diagnoses even if it is present the diagnosis poses a lot of difficulties because of the rarity of the condition in children one will be hesitant to make the diagnosis also 
So, but if you look at the other condition called bipolar spectrum, then that goes up to 11%. So I think we need to focus on this, though it, this may not sound uh, as kind of dramatic as bipolar mania or bipolar depression. There are a lot of people, a lot of uh, adolescents who suffer from this depression, probably which is related to bipolar spectrum and they are not diagnosed in time and they also get the right treatment. So that would be the last part of my discussion. And I think we need to focus on, on that topic too. So let us first go to a little bit of a camp scenario in UK. So I've been working in UK for about 12 years in camps. So my job is mostly locum jobs. I go for four months to six months and I work with at various trusts. So each trust has their own protocols of taking the patient, of diagnosing ADHD, ASD, how they manage them. So actually working at various trusts has really helped me to understand various protocols and compare uh, one with another, and maybe have an idea what is suitable for us also. So most of the children uh, in camps actually are managed by the nurses and the psychologist. Probably in a, in a CAMS outpatient unit, there will be one or two psychiatrists and there will be 20 to 30 people, like the nurses, occupational therapists, family therapists, psychologists, and all that. So we are a very small number. And actually the whole thing is dominated by them, right? And most of the time, the GP referrals go to them first, they see, they make the assessment, they make the diagnosis, whatever, and they continue to manage them. Sometimes, I should not say this, but even children with frank ADHD also, some of them pick up as, that is because due to abuse or trauma, and they keep on giving um, treatments. And maybe a year later, the parents find out that they are not getting the right treatment, and they make a complaint. And at that time, they will be brought to psychiatrist's opinion. Sometimes when particularly children with anxiety and depression also, sometimes the parents complain that they need to see the psychiatrist or um, there is a risk of suicide or severe harm. At that point, they, they bring the child to you. So you are basically as a consultant psychiatrist, child and adolescent psychiatrist in UK, they come to you when they uh, need help, right? Or when they think that the things are beyond them. So, so the psychiatrist is mainly the patients come to you at the end stage. So you don't do the very beginning of assessment, right? By the time the patient comes to you, there is a lot of file, the assessments are already there and it is, it, you don't have to really strain much to come to a conclusion about diagnosis or anything, right? So that is the situation of the psychiatrist in UK. Now, for the convenience, so I thought I could divide the UK CAMS patient groups into kind of two groups. We have two groups, one is age six to 12. Below six are usually managed by uh, pediatricians or developmental pediatricians, and they don't come to us. And, uh, and there's another group 13 to 18. You can clearly kind of segregate them. See, if you look at the kind of presentations, ADHD, oppositional different disorder, tics, autistic spectrum disorders, they dominate in the six to 12 year old group. Coming to the older group, you have more of depression, anxiety, anxiety sometimes can be generalized anxiety, or social anxiety, or anxiety mixed with depression also. And, and self-harm, they usually present uh, with, with self-harm. And and milder autistic spectrum. So these are, these are functioning well till that time, but at that age, they again have a lot of social anxiety or anxiety without any reason. A lot of autistic spectrum uh, children, they do have anxiety. So that is an important uh, cause of anxiety in this group. So they also come under the 13 to 18 group. So if you look at the older patients, about two thirds of my patients are from this older group. So the 13 to 18 actually will have more patients because they present with self-harm 
or attempts to suicide like that. So I'll go to the next slide. Yeah. Coming to the mania in children. So the today's topic is actually bipolar disorder. And probably we should be expecting to focus more on this mania. But mania is not um, that frequent in uh, very young children. You usually see mania in 13, 13 plus, and their presentation is uh, very similar to adults. They will be kind of uh, hyperactive, kind of euphoric, singing or uh, making a lot of noise, and they usually require to go into a psychiatric hospital. So it is said that irritability is more frequent than euphoria. And yes, a lot of these patients present with irritability also. There is one study by Sotulo et al. And he rated the most frequent symptoms. And he found that irritability is present in 96% of children, whereas hyperactivity is seen in 80%. Rapid speech is seen in 72%. And grandiosity, euphoria, hypersexuality, decreased sleep, spending money. So these are more common in what we look for in adult population. That is seen around 50% of children only, you see these features. So irritability is a very prominent uh, feature in, in many and children. So coming to the differential diagnosis aspect. So NICE has given a caution against excess glands on this irritability. They say that irritability is not a very reliable symptom and you have to take various other things also into account because things like uh, kind of uh, abuse, emotional abuse, or all these things can make a child irritable. And uh, depressive mood also can make a child ir irritable. So it is important that we exclude common differential diagnosis conditions. One is ADHD. So ADHD is the condition where overactivity is a core symptom and that we can very easily confuse with, uh, with mania. But the main difference is, whereas, whereas in mania is episodic, usually there is a clear date from one month or two months, he's like, he has been overactive very suddenly. But when, if you look at ADHD, he has been there for a long time. But we also need to remember that the child with ADHD can also have manic episode. Actually, ADHD and bipolar, they are very much comorbid, and there is as much as 40% comorbidity with this, both these conditions. So, so one can have both ADHD and many also. So if you are very, the features of many are very clear, even if there is a diagnosis of ADHD, we should not hesitate to make a diagnosis of bipolar above, on and above the diagnosis of ADHD. Conduct disorder, substance abuse, and emotional and dissociative states due to abuse, all these conditions can lead to kind of overactivity, irritability, and may confuse um, with, the, with the diagnosis. So one need to look for all this, uh, need to look for and exclude all these conditions before coming to a conclusion about many a diagnosis. So, and coming to younger children, the diagnosis in younger children is much more difficult. Uh, you don't see the kind of uh, excess speech or elation kind of things. Usually you see the irritability and probably the child is running around more. And then you have periods where the child is uh, not doing anything socially withdrawn. It is, it is very important that we get a clear history supporting the diagnosis of depressive phase without clearly defining a period of overactivity and then periods of social withdrawal, without uh, making provisions for a diagnosis of mania and depression, it is not uh, right to make a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So as, as I told earlier, the older child often shows typical adult picture uh, requiring admission. So now coming to so what kind of uh, medications you prefer. So now the recent trend in UK is to use 
uh, atypical antipsychotics, particularly aripiprazole has replaced most of antipsychotics. We are, now we are using aripiprazole for like an anxiety associated with autistic spectrum disorder or psychosis or schizophrenia, whatever. The first preferred medication is aripiprazole. And then this is followed by betiapin and risperidone. All these three drugs have approval from US FDA. Coming to the role of anticonvulsants, um, in children, their use, the, the role is limited and they are not advised for routine use by NICE. Now, now coming to probably my favorite topic or the topic which I want to focus today, because these are the cases which occur, which come to me very frequently. About 25% uh, to 30% of my patients belong to this category. I'm sure that these kind of patients will be there in our society also. And probably we need to really look for these, these things so as to make an early diagnosis and give proper treatment. Most of these children are, can be dismissed as borderline personality disorder or some personality disorder or just simply as bad, bad children or spoiled children. Now I will give you a, a case example. Uh, the names are of course not correct. Uh, that by them. So, so Rebecca is a 15 year old young girl. She was seen in AND after she took an overdose of 20 paracetamol tablets. After the overdose, she texted her friend and by our assessment, we thought, okay, it is not a really serious suicide attempt. Um, on taking further history, she said, this is typical uh, history given by most of these patients, that they are feeling low since age 10. Um, some of them will say actually, uh, I'm feeling low ever since actually I know about my mood. So they cannot recollect any happy phase in their life. They say they are, I have always been a happy child. And she says, on most days she feels very low, lethargic. And she also, we are usually asked them to rate their mood on one to 10. Uh, one is very, very low, five is average, and 10 is very, very happy. So these people say our mood is mostly two or three on most days, but they typically describe I, use, I regularly ask them, are there any periods of high mood or kind of suggesting some hypomania? I, I was really surprised that so many of them come say, yeah, I, I'm a bit high for a few hours or one or two days, but then it doesn't last long. And they clearly describe that when they are in the high mood, they are quite active, they socialize, they go out, they enjoy. But, but it doesn't last long and then they crash and for a few days they are in this low phase. So usually we also get a kind of family history of depression, recurrent depression. In the, sometimes you may get a family history of bipolar also. So if you do a PHP score, this girl has scored about 20, indicating clearly moderate severe depression. But now the question is, what is what what should be the diagnosis? Okay, can I can I ask our participants what they think of the diagnosis? I, I did put other possibilities, but what is their their preferred diagnosis for this child? Okay. So usually a case like this. Uh, if one is not really looking for the hypomanic things, or if one is one does not bother to ask about the periods of low, which are uh, periods of high, which are lasting only for a few hours to few days, it will be simply a depression, right? Major depression, moderate, severe episode. You go with antidepressant, and that's fine, right? Uh, nobody will find fault with you. But once you ask. And once you elicit the clear this hypo uh, hypomanic kind of uh, slightly high periods, of course, which are not lasting for one week or anything, so that they don't meet uh, the diagnostic criteria for bipolar two also. So, what diagnosis would you make? 
So you can make a diagnosis of the, you can say cyclothymia, um, or you can say bipolar spectrum, which is not an official diagnosis. But the question is, do these, do, do these patients, some of them who have more severe form of uh, this thing and do a lot of cell form, uh, do not they need uh, the use of atypical antipsychotics? Uh, that is the main question. So even in our population also, I would like to hear from our participants if they have adolescent patients, um, particularly um, girls with this kind of presentations. Right? And, and some of them may benefit from the use of anticonvulsants also. So, so usually what happens in UK is these children, uh, these children get treated with simply with the uh, antidepressant, and they are not going to get uh, atypical antipsychotics or anticonvulsants. If the clinician uh, has elicited this, maybe after two or three trials of antidepressants, then we will introduce atypical antipsychotic, most probably aripiprazole, because it is considered a kind of safe antipsychotic. So now I will go to my last slide which is a, a, a guideline kind of thing for treatment of depression in children. This is uh, prepared by Oxford NHS guidelines. So invariably the first line of uh, medication is fluoxetin. Fluoxetin is uh, usually we start with 10 milligrams, wait for three or four weeks, then increase to 20, then it can go up to 60 milligrams. I have seen a lot of UK psychiatrists going up to 60 milligrams, but my personal opinion is if they don't, if it doesn't work up to 30, then probably I will discontinue and shift to some other medication. Um, I request um, other members also to share their uh, views on this. And the Oxford says the second line of medications, the, the first one, first choice is usually Cetralin. Uh, usually we start 25 milligrams for one week and increase to 50 milligrams. But uh, I usually maybe wait for 25 milligrams for four weeks also because some of them do improve with only 25 milligrams. So you can go up to 200 milligrams with, with cetralin. Cetralin is now has becoming actually more popular than toxin. I don't know for what reason, but it is more prescribed than toxin. Citlopram and acetlopram both are in the second line, but uh, hardly anyone uh, gets prescribed with these medications in the UK. It's mostly fluoxetine or cetralin. So the third line is uh, metazapine, which is 15 milligrams. We prescribe metazapine uh, very easily, but it has been difficult to prescribe metazapine because last time I prescribed, I had a query from the pharmacy, why you have combined fluoxetine with metazapine. So then I have to justify myself getting this guideline out. So most of the time you don't want to do the extra paperwork. So metazapine 15 milligrams and SSRI plus metazapine uh, is also recommended by Oxford. So the advantage with metazapine, as you know, it helps sleep. So you can probably, if you, I, I prefer to add metazapine after with, with, with 10 mg or 20 mg of, of fluoxetine. So then the augmentation with second generation atypical antipsychotics is also recommended. The aripiprazole usually start with two milligrams and you can increase up to 10 milligrams. Or similarly, you can go for quetiapine, 25 milligrams and increase up to 150 milligrams. So augmentation with lithium or otiaxin is also mentioned, but we hardly uh, practice that. So, and another important thing is for every patient who is stable with SSRI, we give a suicide uh, caution. That we tell them that the fluoxetin or acetylene can increase the suicide radiation and they have to stop the medication and inform us immediately if there is any increase in their suicidal ideas. And though actually initially there were some studies indicating that there is a increase in suicidal ideation and increased suicidal attempts also, but no completed suicide. 
but now that has been diluted, uh, not treating with uh, antidepressants actually will increase the suicidal risk much more than starting on an, on an SSRI. So, so we continue to prescribe SSRI with this caution only, and some trust actually have a printed uh, leaflet explaining all the side effects, and we give a copy of that to every patient. So that is the last slide, coming to last slide, is about the psychological treatments. So I did not go into this because most of the patients would have received therapy for months before seeing psychiatrists. Most of them will go to uh, what is CBT-based therapy. And I would like to tell that the most important part, actually, I also tell the patient about the behavioral activation. Even if you can't do a formal cognitive behavior therapy, particularly for depression patients, the behavioral activation that is asking the patient to get uh, active and do the things which they have stopped doing in a gradually increasing way, that will go a long way. For example, ask the patient to just go for a 10-minute walk initially, then 20 minutes, like that. So ask every depression patient to get into activities, all the activities which they have left, like talking to a friend or a hobby or everything, whatever they can take up, they should take up and gradually increase the sale. So, so most of our patients would have received therapy, but sometimes we do prescribe medication early Particularly, the symptoms are very severe. Uh, symptoms are more of biological symptoms, and there is a family history of uh, affective disorder, and the risk of suicide is high. Uh, sometimes, some children say they want medication; they don't want to go through therapy at all. They very clearly tell, "I'm not. I don't want any therapy." In such situations, also, we, we do prescribe medication as as the first choice. Generally, what my observation is is the patient has preference for medication, it is more likely to work. And other is patients who have a lot of psychosocial problem and uh, the response to medication is very poor. And such patients are probably should engage with therapies or something else, uh, resolve their conflicts rather than take the medication and expect the medication to work. So this is uh, my impression. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to take any questions. Actually, I want more interaction to see what the practice you have been doing and to take more, to take more questions or to chair. Thank you, Dr. Keshara, sir. I think it was beyond what was expected, sir. I think uh, we could see the expertise from your practical uh, knowledge that uh, I think uh, Many of us really have to look at uh, uh, bipolar in adolescents and it might be in the uh, pediatric age group. I think it, it needs an expertise and uh, um, basically sir, at, at, at my early stage of practice, sir, it was, uh, I, I used to feel that the BPAD is it's a lifelong problem. So to even to uh, disclose the diagnosis to the parents itself a big thing. So many times I have to refer uh, these children to Dr. Gauri Devi, madam, or you know something like Nilo Farshanaik, madam, at that time. But as you know, I think uh, practice was you know, getting expertise. Sir. I think we were able to talk to the parents, particularly adults since coming with drug abuse, uh, substance abuse. Sir, I think there, I think we are trying to be a little more careful to look at uh, the differential diagnosis between ADHD and uh, uh, BPAD, sir. Thank you, sir, for bringing out a lot of uh, new insights, sir. I think definitely it will help us in our uh, practice. And I see a lot of youngsters are there, sir. Uh, we will uh, take the question, sir. Dr. Pavan. Sir, sir, uh, there are three questions right, uh, sir, there, there right now, sir. One is from an anonymous attendee. What is the current incidence of rapid cycling in children uh, with bipolar affective disorder. What is your preferred drug of choice in these children? So honestly, I have not uh, seen any child with kind of uh, rapid cycling uh, in my experience. So, so usually 
the first choice of medication for any child, you you in combination with risperidone, and then if these don't work, then you think about anticonvulsants. Anticonvulsants are definitely down the line. The first line is uh, a typical antipsychotics because they are working better, and their side effect profile is also better than uh, some of these drugs like valproate, right? So, sir. Uh, next question is from Dr. Vijay Sheshadri, sir. sir. Is there any difference in clinical presentations of bipolar disorder in adolescents in India versus UK? Your comments? Uh, uh, no, no, actually, they are, see, actually, adolescents, whether in India or UK, the presentation is very similar to adult. It's not difficult to uh, kind of diagnose. You see more irritability, that is the only main feature, but they have all the classical features of uh, acute mania. Only in small children, it is a bit more difficult. Sir, uh, another question from uh, Vijay Shishadri, sir. sir. Again, in an individual with uh, clear bipolar disorder and family history of bipolar disorder, would you consider lithium? Is there clinician's practice pattern and hesitation to use lithium also a factor for lack of use of lithium, not only in adolescents, but also in adults? So the use of lithium in adults uh, in UK is very much there, right? Uh, it is going down. Recently, I heard a kind of presentation. Actually, the presentation is why lithium use is going down. So actually, the presenter was uh, speaking for lithium use. But in children, uh, it, it is not used, actually. Lithium is not used in children because of the difficulties with monitoring, whatever. It's because aripiprazole now is taking every, everything is aripiprazole now. Okay. Sir, another uh, question from Abhishek, Dr. Abhishek Mansabdar. Very insightful talk, sir. Thank you so much. Could you please uh, shed some light on the role of uh, OFC in adolescents with bipolar depressive episodes? OFC, orbitofrontal cortex. Is that what you mean? OFC, he says, sir. OFC. Can you use the full form? O o F use of OFCs. Role of OFCs. Arbitofrontal cortex in adolescents with bipolar depression. No, I, I really don't know about that. Actually, that is, uh, yeah, I have not come across. Sir. Um, so, arbitofrontal cortex. Not sure, really. Can... Can doctor throw some light on that? Probably he... Olanzapine flu and fluoxetine in combination, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. I Olanzapine yes, fluoxetine combination is um, very popular in adults. Uh, in children, yes, you can try probably. Probably it should help by the same this thing. But now olanzapine is not at all used in UK in children because of uh, the weight gain issues, met metabolic syndrome side effects. Uh, probably in only in big institutions can give that kind of prescriptions. If I am practicing in a periphery, I don't take the kind of trouble of prescribing this kind of medication. The, the same patient is referred to say Morsley, then they come with this prescription. And even if you know that, you cannot prescribe in a small center. Sir, questions are pouring in, sir. I have one more question from an anonymous attendee. How to differentiate between hypomania and hyperactivity in children? See, the hyperactivity of due to ADHD, yeah. Uh, hyperactivity, it is there for a very long time. Only if it is a hyperactivity of recent kind of onset where you can pin say it's there for the last two weeks and sudden appearance of this and then you exclude uh, other causes like whether there is any other causes. And then you assume that it's probably in bipolar. But, but hypomania itself usually doesn't lead to a diagnosis of bipolarity, particularly in UK. Um, hypomania is quite normal there, quite normal. So unless the person is really causing a lot of uh, trouble, um, they, they, they don't come to our attention also. Sir, one question from my side, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, now that you know, we very well know that uh, depression in uh, adolescents and uh, children presents more or like more with irritability as a symptom. Mm. 
so in that context that is, that is actually in younger children see so children about 12 13 years they clearly express their mood 13 years onward but the younger group of course they clearly the parents says the child is not going out is withdrawn not seeing his friends not coming into the drawing hall he stays in his room so the parents clearly tell he looks depressed also mm-hmm. the tell that he looks depressed he looks sad so the usually in the first line of treatment would be psychological treatment either the school counselor will engage or a psychologist at the general practitioner will engage and only when it goes beyond certain time then they come to our notice so there can be a, again a kind of cbt therapy by our psychologist or if it is too bad then they go for and particularly if there is a family stay i will go for i will push for early treatment in the absence of family stay and in the absence of suppose there is uh, no family stay and there are some psychological issues parental conflict is there then i hesitate to give the prescription so when only when they exhaust all modalities of psychological treatment then we try for the medication sir sir another uh, question sir uh from uh, they have not named themselves thank you for an excellent presentation sir any evidence on the role of uh, endoxifen in children and adolescents if yes what is the dose that can be prescribed endoxifen this this you have to learn coming to india actually <laughs> we, we have not if you ask most uk psychiatrists they have not heard that name also so doctor tell me what if there is any role but i cannot prescribe there so I, honestly i have no idea about uh, small kid though i heard about it here only sir uh, dr divya asks uh, how to differentiate mania and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder here yeah, disruptive mood uh, regulation disorders once again they are like uh, related to conduct disorder or adhd so usually by history they have a much longer history and then for a mania probably you also get a history of uh, uh, depressive phases where a phase of withdrawal and all so sometimes it can be difficult so so you give sufficient time wait and if it is uh, and you address the whatever the those issues uh, then if, it, if the history is not forthcoming there is no reason for this disruptive mood disorder and uh, you have other features also no? the, the person's kind of aggression as other features associated with that so usually a manic person may not have that kind of uh, disruptive kind of uh, acts like damaging things or property or aggression or cruelty kind of things so you 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 think go oh, probably this looks more like disruptive so sir sir mayurna dridi sir has uh, put one question sir like uh, rpprozol uh, is commonly used drug in uk if that is so in india we are seeing akathisha in children even with the 2 mg of doses so why is the difference no i i have not seen actually this kind of side i actually have a surprise i am not a good uh, kind of um, i had i can't have a good faith in this drug but now i am seeing it is working even in adults also very well and in uk also i have seen that the children are doing okay with this medication actually um, anxiety is a very common disease a listed very commonly listed side effect but i am not seeing that much because earlier when it came first we used to prescribe a diazepam along with it so that they don't develop this uh, agitation but uh, now it seems okay sir yeah, that is okay sir one more question sir uh, from an anonymous attendee mm-hmm. can mm-hmm. argumenting with uh, rpprozol in case of bipolar affective disorder with mania in another sense who is on sodium valproate and have rapid cycling will be useful yeah i think definitely arbitrazol uh, i would try i i will try arbitrazol as the first choice as an augmenting drug sir and and quetiapine also because it, it it gives a lot of sleep and probably quetiapine also should be useful in particularly in many phases uh dr nivedita madam as uh, dissociative identity disorder as a comorbidity in bipolar affective disorder in adolescents what is your comments dissociative is not as much comorbid as uh, like uh, for example 
ADHD is 40%, oppositional disorders about 12%, anxiety 32%, substance abuse 20%. I have the list in front of me. Don't think I'm, I'm having memory of all these things. But I have not come across uh, dissociative disorder. Uh, the thing is actually dissociative disorders are uh, less and less diagnosed, particularly in countries like UK, because most tra trainees probably don't have any clue about this, what is this dissociative disorder. It's all either depression or psychosis, one way or other way. Sir, Gauri Madam, uh, Gauri Madam has uh, put one comment, sir, like uh, sudden episodic interest in dieting, gymming, doing business, music and arts, along with overactivity and overconfidence lasting for a few months and the waning off had been seen in uh, adolescence in the initial phase before typical bipolar affective disorder is est established is seen in my practice. Usually family history of a recurrent depressive disorder or a bipolar affective disorder positive. Seen good response with lithium and atypicals sharing my experience. Dr. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. It is really, yeah. Uh, the family history, I say, is very important. If you have a good family history, positive family history, then my preference to medication and diagnosis changes very much. In the absence of that, it becomes more difficult. Sir, can I ask you a question, sir? Yes, on. Josh. Anybody in line? Yes, uh, sir. Sir, uh, how would you guide the youngster, sir? Uh, recently passed out uh, psychiatrist, sir. Let's say that they, they've seen a child in adolescent phase and it, it, it diagnosis for sure a case of bipolar uh, affective disorder. Uh, how would you wish, uh, how would you guide them, sir? Because uh, even as I said, sir, to talk about the diagnosis, you know, trying to convince the family members to take uh, medication and hold on for uh, months, this is, is a major challenge, sir, because uh, in this generation, I think current time we have mobiles, everybody Googles. So there's a lot of disparity or uh, various uh, uh, links, sir. So I think it's scary, sir. How do you, what do you want to guide? Uh, how do you want to guide our youngsters, sir? Okay. No, no, the first thing is, uh, uh, of course, the youngster has sufficient uh, experience. So, so one needs to have sufficient experience in, in the particular area, right? So we assume that he has that. But certain things like uh, disclosing the diagnosis, like suppose you have a diagnosis, that, like, like like you you strongly suspect the diagnosis is schizophrenia, and you are very sure also that all the first line symptoms are there, and they have come to you for the first time. So in UK, I don't tell them that this is uh, this is what is going to be. I think I say that okay, this is this, this, this kind of psychosis. It could be this. So this kind of thing goes on in UK for one two visits. Then, then only we'll disclose, no, no, it is it's getting clearer and clearer because we have to prepare the family also. Suppose if you suddenly tell them that your child has schizophrenia, it is a good talk to them, right? So it's not fair also. It's like uh, how you disclose is also important, right? So, and at the same time, uh, even if you know the progress is very bad, you should not tell, he's not going to, he has got all the bad prognostic signs. You should not use that kind of thing. So we have to say, we have to wait and see, we cannot tell now. So these are typical questions. How long I have to use the medications are lifetime? No, no, at least two years, at least six months. So then you increase. So this is all senior practitioners, experienced practitioners doing in India. And they're also, it's also the same. So we, we, we try to soft pedal the issues. Hello. Sir, one uh, question from Dr. Shadma Siddiqui, sir. Sir, you are drug of choice in depressive phase in children. Um, my first choice is fluoxetine only. Sir. Fluoxetine. And I don't find any difference between fluoxetine or sertraline, actually. But I prefer fluoxetine uh, because it is available in 10 MG capsule also in UK. So, prefer that. Sir. Sir, Dr. Rajesh, sir, has raised his hand. I'm allowing him to talk, sir. Yes, please. Sir, Rajesh, sir. Please, please. Yeah, good evening, uh, Dr. Kesharo, sir. Yeah, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, nice to see you on uh, on this platform. And uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you, sir. On the occasion of World Bi Bipolar Day, um, what is your uh, 
pure lamotrigine as a mood stabilizer in uh, uh, childhood and adolescent uh, uh, bipolar depression or any other such uh, disorders so, so lamotrigine is i have not seen anyone using in uk camps are actually um, very rarely used maybe by higher centers most of the time uh see the good thing about child psychiatry is um you diagnose probably at the age of 15 or 16 2 3 years you try some drugs erythritol and 18 you will pass on to adult psychiatrist so <laughs> so, all, so all your difficult patients will go to adult psychiatry that is a good thing about child psychiatry in uk okay yeah yeah <laughs> so, pavan sir can you uh... bring dr gauri devi madam in will madam sir, can i ask one second sir I'll and uh, i have my senior dr bendi sairam from vizac and uh, dr bjp malika madam also is here thank you dr sai thank you malika madam uh, sir i wanted to ask you one question sir uh, you you said that uh, many of child psychiatry cases or problems in child psychiatry they are seen by counselors in uk and uh, after some time it uh, they are filtered and uh, only some cases reach uh, to uh, child psychiatrist but in, yeah. but in india we have so so large number of patients and so large number of children but we hardly see any children coming to psychiatrist very very few children in our general practice we see uh, hardly five to seven Seven ten percent maximum of children in our practice uh, who are having good uh, child psychiatry practice. Uh, that I would say, uh, why the difference? And is there a scope of young psychiatrist into child psychiatry? And what can they do? Uh, whether they go to schools and create awareness about psychological problems in children? Because we see lots of death suicides in children. And India, as you know, it's a suicide capital of. the world most of the adolescents uh, commit or attempt suicide so can this problem be solved by going to schools or creating awareness among schools and yeah, children yeah. Well, very very good suggestion minaj it's really important because even in well educated parents parents are not aware of uh, the kind of childhood mental health problems like adhd kind of things parents are not aware uh, and the other thing is even some of our psychiatrists are also not believing in the diagnosis of adhd i have come across some patients saying that they have been to a psychiatrist and he said that there is nothing like adhd uh, get lost right so this kind of things also i have heard so there is a, now actually more than uh, child adhd a lot of adult adhd people are coming a lot of the software people they are reading about adult adhd and then they are uh, going to psychiatrist approaching psychiatrist uh, one thing is uh, uh, what i should not say this but the, sometimes you, you really have to make an effort to make a good diagnosis for example giving adhd diagnosis in just by parent interview so you have to be a proper evaluation like getting from from the two sources from the teachers also and then con- and then also try the behavioral methods and when the all that fails then you start treatment with a long term plan most of the time i have seen prescription started and the prescription after one month or two months that is discontinued because it is a half hearted treatment the dosage was not reduced to a certain level so then the patient will just uh, thinks of okay, that this is not something for psychiatry so i think we need to kind of focus on training young psychiatrists in this area one is uh, um, child psychiatry Uh, particularly adhd is very easily you can very easily train them and they can very easily start treating uh, even if they don't want to take up other things like asd which more much more complicated adhd it is the pediatricians who are prescribing in uk not pediatricians it is the nurses who have started prescribing it hardly takes kind of one day training for our psychiatrists to be thorough with the uh, young psychiatrists to be thorough with the adhd prescription the nurses are pre- prescribing and you can and i only give the stamp diagnosis confirmed and they start giving the prescription and only complicated cases come to me sir gauridev madam is here in the panel sir, sir. yes madam hello thank you, you. hi hello 
మేడం కనపడట్లేదు స్పేస్ వచ్చేట్టు వచ్చేయగలరా మేడం ఇట్స్ నాట్ ఇట్స్ పాసిబుల్ ఆన్ దిస్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ మేడం నో ఇట్స్ ఓకే ఐ థింక్ ఐ ఆడిబుల్ yes మేడం యా యా మేడం యా యా వెల్కమ్ మేడం మీరు వచ్చారు ముందే థాంక్ యు యా no basically there are a couple of issues i just want to add it's a very good presentation very brief but uh, you know uh, quite uh, uh, precise uh, the thing which i just want to say is like adhd and bpad i've seen number of children in my experience who were diagnosed adhd and we have been treating them as uh, adhd at a later date when they become adolescents or getting into adulthood you find sudden change in their behavior uh, either in the form of uh, odd sudden appearance of odd or you know uh, uh, freak i mean interest into odd things that's another thing which i have seen like you no know, adhd suddenly developing episodic uh, kind of odd or interest in weird things uh, i think children uh, uh, getting into bipolar disorder in such cases i have seen i do vmrs and find that the manic scores are little high that's just i wanted to add that and yes, another sorry. important thing is that now with uh, uh, the other uh, important thing i have seen three or four children uh, the gambling and especially the uh, uh, with this internet and then gaming and uh, uh, children episodically especially these boys are very brilliant boys and they start going for gaming and uh, using parents uh, uh, credit cards and uh, and suddenly disappears this is something which i found it very interesting and they said no because the child is spoiled and other thing when you go into the family history you find that there is a family history of uh, you know uh, substance use disorder or the uh, alcohol dependence syndrome or you know borderline personality or depression in the family so this is something i just i mean these are all little rare cases but i think one need to think about these cases when there is adhd turning into different scenario or picture you need to think about adhd with uh, bipolar turning to bipolar or the, the problem again uh, difficulty is that odd and uh, bipolar disorder in adolescence because they seem to be very very uh, i mean common symptoms uh, uh, arrogance and you know uh, aggression so these are the behaviors they do manifest so that sometimes you know, in the adolescence it's very difficult to diagnose but only thing is you need to uh, follow them up rather than making a diagnosis uh, that's what i feel yes madam actually i have seen one patient in forensic setting in uk that fellow has a childhood diagnosis of adhd and later he at some point is diagnosed as bipolar and also borderline personality disorder and aspd also so yeah. kind of uh, i think they are all kind of interlinked the adhd and probably is bipolar comorbidity uh, producing all this uh, personality disorder kind of behaviors also so they all yes madam they, they frequently go together sir uh dr kishan sir has raised his hand sir sir please sir. unmute sir sir kishan sir thank you thank you pawan sir as usual dr keshorao is very crisp and uh, he uses few slides and uh, very brief uh, that is a uh, um very impressive talk the only two three points i want to share one thing there is a discussion in arp among arp prozol so if you start arp prozol now arp prozol is low dose tablets available first when it was introduced 5 mg that uh, doses are different first now arp prozol is introduced in a very low doses when you mm-hmm. actually what keshara is telling for chill pediatric population generally mm-hmm. they go for low doses so in adults also i am using low dose of aripiprazol starting even any any antipsychotic can be replaced with aripiprazol with very slow overlapping dose slowly tapering other antipsychotics and are keeping aripiprazol wonderful quality of life is there with aripiprazol that i want to share and uh, agree with uh, keshara so next is olanzapine almost uh, keshara sir telling is that olanzapine is decreased in europe 
I I told I am telling my experience when I went to uh, international conference of biological psychiatry in 2004 at Sydney. The big debate between Olanzapin School of Thought and uh, Respiratory School of Thought. That is Johnson and other company. So they I convinced very well that not only external obesity, internal obesity. That is obesity, the fat accumulation in the momentum, fat accumulation in the uh, even between intestines, lot of fat and even vessels, big vessels. So this will not appear outside. So then I, when I came back four years, four or five years, I stopped writing Polanjapin. But everybody is mm. writing Polanjapin and Polanjapin harmony is going on. Now I started Polanjapin. So I'm equally using Polanjapin and Respiratron. Now we have to learn. I learned a lot of things from American group, a lot of things from European group. Now European group is now stopping the Olanzapin. We should learn from that. Olanzapin is one of the better. We should protect the patient is important. And if anybody, if your brother is becoming obese, internal obesity, you accept or not. So that is the thing, spirit, you should continue. So Olanzapin giving a big rate is high, something high. But Respiratron is the cheapest drug and other drugs are cheap and uh, very effective. So, as you equal to at least we have to keep in our mind. Olanzapin is still a good drug. But uh, try start with Olanzapin, at least shift in further uh, course. That is a, a thing I want to share with uh, Keshara. So, thank you, sir. Thank you yeah. for giving the opportunity. It's a very important uh, advice by Kishan. Actually, for the inpatients, I do use olanzapine, but once after discharge, gradually over the next few months, I switch over to aripiprazole. Sometimes they may have 5 milligrams of olanzapine and 15 mg of aripiprazole also. Like that, I try to switch as much as possible. But olanzapine is an excellent drug. I don't think any drug is as effective as olanzapine. Sir, we have a, a few more questions, sir. Uh... What should be the approach uh, towards a child and, uh, less than 10 years with a depression or bipolar disorder? With uh, all the stigma of taking medicine, uh, it should be started with a therapy which is easily acceptable or medication where uh, poor compliance or not, uh, not at all coming to doctor in future can be a possibility. How to deal with it? See, see the, the, uh, for the children, the psychological treatments are the first line, right? Only, only when they when they fail or they are not acceptable to the child or there is an urgency like a suicidal risk or aggression or some kind of urgency, then only we go for uh, pharmacological treatment. The first choice is definitely the psychological treatments. One of the things, particularly in children, where they are not see, see they are not cognitively well developed young children. The only thing is behavioral activation. You take them out. You make them do things, kind of things. So, so it is only behavioral activation part of the CBT. Um, cognitively, probably, yeah, there are some wonderful books like uh, um, the drawings and all that also CBT therapists do. I don't remember the book name now. I can give it later. Uh, yeah, the week. You, you can do CBT for children, uh, something like seven years plus. Sure. And uh, another question, sir, how to manage an adolescent uh, who is on fluoxetine for depression or anxiety presenting with suicidal ideations? So anxiety, the, the first choice uh, in UK is usually now sertraline, SSRIs, uh, sertraline or fluoxetine. And if they don't work, then we add a small dose of aripiprazole. We usually start with the 2 milligrams and maybe increase to 5 or 10. The next drug which we also use for anxiety is sometimes, particularly if there is associated sleep problem, it could be quetiapine, like 25, 50 milligrams. And also, risperidone is also a small dose, like 0.5 mg also we prescribe. So these are the standard practices in UK. SSRI first, followed by low dose antipsychotics, aripiprazole, quetiapine, or risperidone. Sir. Probably the uh, last question is continuation of the previous uh, question, sir. Yeah, okay. Actually, uh, uh, can yeah. I just add uh, for the previous Madam, question? Please. Yeah, uh, as the Keshara rightly pointed out, I think certainly it has a, a property of uh, 
taking care of anxiety as well as depression is the first choice. And in addition to the antipsychotics to uh, cut down agitation and anxiety, I prefer uh, lithium also added on, especially if the adolescent has uh, suicidal ideation. I think in adolescents, uh, somehow in our country also, lithium is underutilized. And I've seen the role of uh, lithium being, I mean, really useful in the cases where they had suicidal attempts or suicidal ideation. But you need to try to ah. later, and then you can add on the CBT at a later date. Then, yeah, for the compliance, for the, I mean, initially they won't be accepting the treatment. Such patient psychoeducation is the first important thing. You need to make them understand the diagnosis and the course of the disorder. And you know the usefulness of the medication and the problems which occur if a patient doesn't take the medication. Then many of the patients' relatives they come back. Uh, they they observe the person and then when the suicidal threat is there or the symptoms are worsening, invariably they come back and ask for the medication. This is just to add on to what uh, Keshura has told. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, the last question is probably the continuation of the previous question, sir. Drug yes. after uh, stopping fluoxetine. Drug Choice after uh, stopping fluoxetine. See, uh, after stopping, if the fluoxetine doesn't work, then I usually go for SSRI as the next line. Uh, another SSRI is acrolin. But if sometimes I go for venlafaxin also, in the UK setting also, I do prescribe venlafaxin. Particularly, if a lot of vegetative symptoms are present, kind of not responding to this, the family history, so they may require a SNRI. So, but I try SNRI after two SSRIs only. So, that's it, sir. These are the questions we had for today, sir. So, President, sir. Yeah, Pavan. Sir, go to you, sir. sir uh, thank you, sir. I think uh, many questions uh, you answered. Uh, yes, sir. Precisely, I think uh, we'll be going home with uh, a good awareness about the topic, sir. Uh, uh, Keshara, sir, I think uh, we, will, we will use your services, sir. I think uh, uh, we need more and more topics from you, sir. Thank you very much, Jarad. It's my privilege. Thank you. So thank you, sir. You are in your village, and uh, I can see the backdrop, sir. Sir, yeah, this is my in the village. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I put all yes, my mementos in the background. Sir, do you do a lot of charity? No Every month you do the no charity free clinics, no, sir. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Uh, and uh, at the outset, sir, I think I should thank Pawan, sir, because. Uh, really, I have to apologize. I forgot that today is World Bipolar Awareness Day. I think, Pavan, thank you. Uh, yes, timely, uh, uh, I think, uh, our brain, we got Keshwaro, sir, into mind and uh, choosing particularly yes. into child psychiatry. Uh, yes. I think uh, it went on well and good attendance, sir. Uh, yes. Pavan, um, yes. I, I thank uh, all the seniors, Dr. Kishan, sir, uh, Dr. Gauri, madam, Dr. Mayur, sir, Chandrasekhar, sir, many seniors were there and um, many colleagues, seniors from AP also were there. Uh, I think even Dr. Savita Malhotra, madam, also wanted to join. I think it, she asked, but I think a link was not active right, at that time, I think. Anyway, uh, Pavan, uh, would you uh, give the vote of thanks? Sir, at the outset, sir, I thank uh, Keshara, sir, sir. Uh, for accepting at a short notice and giving us uh, this wonderful lecture, sir. It was very interactive, as you can see. And the questions were still pouring in. I think there was some technical glitch and uh, it was uh, not possible, sir. But anyways, but thank you, sir. Despite, uh, you know, being in uh, your village, you took out time for us and uh, it made this day. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, President, sir, and uh, Minas, sir. And th thank uh, Gauri Devi, madam, and Rajesh, sir. And Kishan, sir, for attending this and uh, sharing your wisdom. And thank all the participants who have been, uh, you know, despite short notice, have come. And thank you, Icon Pharma. And thank you, Aril Martin. Thank you all. Have a good day. And postgraduates too, Pawan. Sir, uh, thank you, postgraduates who have been present here. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very interactive session.
थैंक यू केशरव सर आपका आफ्टर सो मेनी इयर्स आई एम सीइंग योर हाउस